Welcome back to Gun and Shot TV. Uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, my idea that being an eclectic collector is interesting. Uh, my dad's one of those people that all through my life he'd always pick up random things at gun shows. And as a kid, you're like, what the hell is that? Why did he buy that? Um, today, I'm going to talk about some swords that he picked up. I remember we were at, I think, a Badger show up in, uh, I think they used to do them up in, I think it was Madison at like a Holiday Inn or something. Um, and, uh, I remember he, he did some really interesting stuff at that gun show. Um, but one, one time he went and I remember I was a little kid and I was walking around with him and he bought a sword and I'm like, why the hell would you buy a sword? Cause now you gotta carry a sword around the gun show for two hours. Cause this was a big show. And, uh, then, uh, he comes up to another table a little later and he buys yet another sword, the same exact sword. So what these are, are 1913. M1913 Patton Sabres. Um, a lot of people know George F. Patton was the World War II tank guy. You know, we've seen the movie with George C. Scott where he plays Patton. Last Days of Patton was a sequel that covered actually more of Patton's earlier life for some reason in a movie called Last Days of Patton. But um, Patton was actually a very, very smart guy. He was a little bit kooky. He thought he was a reincarnated Roman general or something. But some of the stuff that he did, especially before joining, um, you know, before World War II, I mean, he served with Pershing during the Mexican War with uh, Pancho Villa and all that stuff when we were running around doing all kinds of stuff in Mexico. And that was really where a lot of the tank skills and stuff he used during World War II, I mean, he developed a lot of that. And he was more of a cavalry guy, actually. And he used a lot of the ability, the fast movement of cavalry. He adapted those techniques into tanks. So he was actually a pretty big um, equestrian rider. Um, he was actually an Olympic athlete in the 1912 Olympics. And he competed in the modern pentathlon, I believe it was. And it was five different events. I think there was shooting, I think overall athleticism. Like, you know, I think like a track and field type thing. There was fencing, there was equestrian riding, uh, and I believe swimming. I think that's five. But if not, you can always look it up on Wikipedia. And out of, I think it was somewhere around 30, 40 uh, Olympians, he came fifth overall. So not too shabby. And he was the only American that went. I'm sure he just went on his own. You know, I don't think there was a team back then. And uh, I think most of the people that uh, placed and that Olympics were actually people in the home country where the Olympics was made. So there wasn't a lot of people that were flying around the world to be in the Olympics at that point. I'm sure it was most of the time. So he, he had some pretty interesting ideas. Like I said, 1912 Olympics. Um, obviously, skilled equestrian rider, skilled fencer. So the military at the time, this is prior to World War I. You got to remember, technology was changing rapidly. The 1911 came out in 1911. So, you had a lot of people in the upper echelon of the military that were probably around in the time of the Civil War. Um, when you shot your, your, your gun, and then you switched to your sword. Um, maybe you had a pistol, but that was probably one shot as well, maybe six shots. And then it came down to swords or bayonets. You know, even in World War I, we still had giant long bayonets. The idea was that they still felt the sword was a, a valid way to fight, but things like tanks, machine guns, barbed wire, gas, kind of made edge weapons pretty dated by World War I. But we didn't really know that going into World War I. So in 1913, the U.S. military was still actually developing swords for the cavalry. So this is the M1913 Cavalry Saber, and this was designed by George F. Patton. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, he said that the M1 Grand was the best weapon. You know, he, he had a little bit of say in, in picking what he thought was the best weapon. He actually designed weapons like this Sabre for the military. So, um, this is actually a 1918 Landers, Frary, and Clark. Um, these were made coming up to World War One, but they never actually got used. By the time we got the cavalry over to France, we figured out that machine guns kind of made the cavalry worthless. So they were never really used. I mean, there are some stories that supposedly these were sent to 
China and possibly saw some use, you know, by Marines or something outside of the cavalry. Um, and by World War II, you actually saw these. They would take them and cut the blade into three chunks, and they would make combat knives with the chunks of these blades. So sometimes you can actually find those combat knives with these 1913 to 1918 stamping crowns. If you ever see one, and they just have a crappy plastic handle, so if you ever see one that's got that uh, marking. But Patton designed this, like I said, as a cavalry, as a cavalry weapon. The idea was you could slash with it, but it was really designed to be a point weapon to jab in. Um, there's some problems with trying to joust, essentially. I mean, Patton was, like I said, thought he was a reincarnated Roman general, so he probably thought jousting was the way to go. But uh, really, you jab somebody on a sword, you're going to either have to let go of the sword or break your wrist or get pulled off your horse. There's no, uh, there's no really good use for this uh, as far as I see it, and especially by the time machine guns and tanks come around, it's pretty worthless. But definitely a really neat weapon. It's, it's really ergonomic. It's got a nice place to rest your thumb. Um, it's pretty light. It's pretty maneuverable. This one is actually just your basic 1913 saber, and uh, it actually has a very dinged-up handguard. Now, this was either actually used for some sort of sparring or something like that, or training, um, or it's possible, you know, maybe it was in uh, between 1918 when it was made and the time my dad got it in the 90s. It, it, it's possible it was like in a theater production company or something because the, the, the guard is actually very smashed up and scratched up like someone was, was using it for some purpose. It also has a couple decent chips out of the blade here. So somebody was actually doing something with it. I don't know what. Um, these are kind of neat. Uh, maybe I'll play a little Fruit Ninja with them a little bit later. But uh, interesting, too, when you swing them through the air, you'll get some uh, really neat movie sword fighting sound effects from the blood cutter, as it were, um, just whistling through the air. But, but definitely really cool. And, you know, I'm not a big sword guy, but definitely a cool piece of history. Another interesting tidbit. So we don't actually have two scabbards. We only have one scabbard. This is... The scabbard that we have and this is just your basic black scabbard um, and I think it's I think it's actually wood with a canvas wrapper on it and you can see kind of it's a little chewed up in spots but um, this scabbard should actually go with this black sword this one is an officer sword and this is a 1914 dated Springfield Armory production and this is I'm gonna guess nickel plated could be chrome, but it's it's got a very uh, dressy hilt here and guard, and that would have been for ceremonial use or anything. Like I said, these these didn't actually really get used in battle for anything, so probably quite a few got turned into officer swords. There actually was a different scabbard that would have come with an officer sword that was all metal and went down to a nicer point. Um, but Definitely interesting. I wouldn't want to carry one of these all day. These were made to be carried on a horse. Um, carrying it all day would be very heavy, and they're, they're pretty long, actually. So I was going to shove it in my pants. I realized that's probably not a good idea. But uh, definitely interesting. Um, I think they go for somewhere around, you know, maybe three, 400 bucks for one that's in rough shape, up to six, 800 I, I haven't actually seen that many of the officer-style ones that are all chromed out. Um, go for sale. I don't know what they would be worth, um, but definitely worth picking up if you see one. But I, I wouldn't count on seeing that many of them. They're probably uh, somewhat rare. Not to go too cold steel, but I figured uh, we'll demonstrate. <sighs> the shape of the blood gutter or whatever you want to call it on the side here. When you swing it, it makes movie sound effects sword noises every time. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, if you were to, for example, use this in a film, you could maybe, if you didn't stab anyone, just skip on the sound effects budget. <laughs> 